Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, it's kind of an interesting night. As you can see, we have a, a number of things here to connect because you get the fullness of the riches of all that God has, right? And we want to connect the dots for you. So we'll try to do that. Mary, did you know, right? This is an unusual alignment right now because um, what you find Christmas Eve and Hanukkah, some of you, you got the ping that went out there, the email alert. It's only happened four times in the last hundred years. And this is the first time it's happened in this century. And so when God crosses those things over them, we pay attention to it. Okay. By the way, why is even Christmas Eve a deal? Do you know? Where did that come from? Right? Why isn't it just Christmas Day? Why is Christmas Eve? Christmas Eve. You know why? Why? Why, Charlie? Because it was the night before Christ was born. Okay, it was the night before Christ was born, right? But that's still, it could be the night before. It doesn't quite tell me why it would be special. Anybody know? Well, anybody here that was raised Catholic? When did you have Mass? Midnight. Midnight, Christmas Eve. Because traditionally it's considered, think about every movie you've ever seen or pageant ever done when Jesus is born. Is he born in the day or in the night? Stars out. It stars out, so he's born in the night. So that's why Christmas Eve, right, is because it's considered that during the night is when he was born. Now that aligns very interesting with Hanukkah because you know God's calendar, his clock, starts when? Six. And at six. Dark. At what? Dark. At dark. It's sundown, right? That's when he starts a new day. So it's interesting right now, Christmas Eve and the start of Hanukkah align together. So let me just connect a couple of dots for you just without going deep, deep into it. Let's see. Phil, can you read this out loud? Real loud? Every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out his treasure, what is new and what is old. This is Jesus speaking about those who are trained in the ways of the Old Covenant, right? The scribes who really knew it and are trained in the Kingdom of God. So you just see this, the richness that you're pulling in together of the Kingdom understanding as well as that. Okay, here's another one. Who can read this out loud? Loudly. Where? Gailin? Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world. Keep going. But now in Christ Jesus, if you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Okay, dividing wall of hostility, right? Tremendous hostility and is still out there, right? A lot of anti-Semitism, a lot of in terms of how we have set things up poorly as the followers of Jesus and persecuting the roots of Jesus right through Hebraic roots it's like that's really dumb but we've done that so the idea is that in this time particularly we note that these two come together Hanukkah and Christmas Eve it's yet another occurrence where it's breaking down the wall of hostility right there are more and more churches that are understanding we're connected there's a root structure in it. It's referenced in John 10, the Feast of Dedication, the Feast of Hanukkah, for a reason. God brought it forward into time so that we would know that. And why is that? Because here, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, but all are one in Christ Jesus. Now, this is a huge, hairy deal for us, right? You understand that we believe in one new man. Now, what this means is it does not mean you try to be Jewish, just so you know. There are places that really try to do that. I, I, okay, that's great. If they want to do that, I don't think that's what we're called to do. I think it's about one new man, right? We don't come under that burden. We understand the freedom of it. But there's more than just Jew and Greek. We're grafted into the promises, all the promises of the covenant. And because of that, we want the fullness thereof, right? I was trying to find a good picture for one new man, but I found these soldiers standing out in front of this scroll, and it just sort of, does that work for you? Yeah, yeah, there actually was part of the opening ceremony at the, at the uh, Beijing Olympics. But I just kind of liked it because it felt like a group of people that were all looking at the scrolls, right? And I'm just going to interpret and say that's the word of God there. 
But it's a huge heart that we have for one new man, that we break down the barriers there. And that also goes male, female, right? There's just been too much oppression of women, often at the hand of the church, rather than freeing them into their gifting. Slave and free, right? Now we're gonna go into that economic changes, the classes and the classism that is so rife, right, in this country. Y'all, did you see, hear about Time Magazine, right? Donald Trump, the man of the year, president of the divided states of America, is the phrase they used, okay? The divided states. Now, the problem is you start putting a phrase out there and it starts becoming a reality, okay? We are about breaking down the division and the walls. What's really important and what's not, okay? So, and it's gonna go back always, Emmanuel, right? We're gonna first honor the fact that that Jesus, now we all know, we've talked about historically why we don't believe he was actually born in this time, but we're not uptight about it because any time is a great time to celebrate Jesus coming to earth. But again, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child, will bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. So it all has to start with Jesus. But then we remember the realities that the manger was mangy, right? Now, I guess to make a point, <laughs> we were out last night and uh, our old doggy um, sometimes has challenges. And so our, my office is kind of a safe place because he hangs out there most of the day. And when we came home, he'd kind of had the poops all over my office. There was no kind of. And this is just wiped out the whole office. And I had to sit there, it's like, okay, so the door's closed, the window's open. Kim did what she could, but I thought, you know what, if you're trying to show me, Lord, what a manger is like, you've done a good job. Uh, right? I mean, just, and so, we, we have all this very romantic notion of it, and there's all this pristine hay and everything, and it's just like, you know, the promise of God comes after 700 years, and you know, Mary's got to be sitting there going, what? I thought this was going to be in a palace. Not in the stables, but you know, the star comes over and then of course you get this bundle of joy. But we cannot enter into Christmas at all without isolating this. This is a saying from a guy named Stephen Covey called begin with the end in mind. It means whatever you do, wherever you're going, you need to start with the end in mind. And so when we look at the start of Jesus, we have to begin with the end in mind, which is what? It's right here. Right, this is the challenge. We're, we're very comfortable as a culture with a way in a manger. <coughs> zippity doo da. Yeah, everything kind of hopeful. Nice, clean, pristine, stable. This never existed in Earth, right? The way we have it envisioned. And the angels show up to who first? The shepherds, not exactly high on the totem pole, right? In culture and society. And if you look back farther, you'll understand the Egyptians and that whole culture disdained shepherds right? And they're the ones that the angels go to first. And the astrologers, the magi, follow in the star. All this stuff going on, but it begins with the end in mind, and so we're going to move now into a time of communion. Do you understand? Because you need to embrace this all together. But I wanted to, uh, to give us a little bit of structure here. Do you know where this verse is from? But he gives, gives us more grace. God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Uh, no. Come on, where? <coughs> James. Okay. He opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So here's what I want you to do. With your willingness, I want you to say these things together. These are standards about praying for deliverance. This actually came from a devotional uh, that Kim got that was from uh, Lou Giglio. And I was reading part of this. Can you read that? Sure. With me. From the desire of being praised, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being honored, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being preferred, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being consulted, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being approved, deliver me, Jesus. 
from the desire for comfort and ease, deliver me, Jesus. Are you praying these as you're saying them? Right? This is preparing your heart. So let's keep going. There's some more. From the fear of being humiliated, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being criticized, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being passed over, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being forgotten, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being lonely, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being hurt, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of suffering, deliver me, Jesus. So a way in a manger is headed for the cross. And the promises of God go through the strainer. And we go through the strainer because God has more. And His way is just not our way. And one last set of these now. That others may be loved more than I. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be chosen and I set aside. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be praised, and I go unnoticed. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. O oh, Jesus, meek and humble of heart, make my heart like yours. Strengthen me with your spirit. Teach me your ways. Father, we come before you now to celebrate with the end in mind. Thank you for Emmanuel, God being with us, because it wasn't enough that you just show up. You had to show us how, but then you had to lay it all down. We acknowledge the deep humility that you showed in being the creator of the galaxies, and yet starting off in that small embryonic dot, being born as a small child, learning to walk and to talk moving into adulthood, but then setting your face like flint to Jerusalem. And we thank you for the sacrifice on the cross of Jesus. And so I relay unto you what was also relayed unto me, that in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them and said, Take, eat all of this. This is my body broken for you. In like manner also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim my death until I come again. Phil and Galen are going to distribute elements. We have wine as the lighter color. We have grape juice for those who need it. Phil, will you release a blessing, please, over those wine, over that wine? Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless this wine that signifies your blood, and we remember this until you come. We thank you, Lord, for sacrificing yourself and shedding your blood on the cross so that we may be saved. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Galen, the bread. Lord, we thank you for this bread that symbolizes your body broken for us. Lord, help us to become more real to us than ever before. The amazing sacrifice that you made on our behalf. We thank you, Lord, for your, your tremendous love for us. So Phil and Gilleen are going to hand out the elements. Just hold them for a minute. We're going to sing together, and then we'll take them together. Lord, make me a house. Make me a house of bread. Lord, make me a house. Make me a house of prayer. Let the fire.
fire of my altar never burn out. The fire of my altar never burn out. May the fire of my altar never burn out. Make me a house of prayer. May the fire of my altar never burn out. The fire of my altar never burn out. May the fire of my altar never burn out. Make me a house of prayer. Make me a house. Make me a house of prayer. I say, Lord, make me a house. Make me a house of prayer. May the fire of my altar never burn out, the fire of my altar never burn out, may the fire of my altar never burn out, make me a house of prayer, to never burn out, the fire of my altar never burn out, may the fire of my altar never burn out, make me a house of Jesus, my body, my body, partake of my body. In the other hand, it's the blood, the truth, the cost that it had to be shed. For what? For life, not just eternal, but now. The fire of my altar never burn out. The fire of my altar never burn out. May the fire of my altar never burn out. Make me a house of prayer. May the fire of my altar never burn out. The fire of my altar never burn out. May the fire of my altar never burn out. Make me a house of prayer. So together. Lord, we acknowledge the body. Every sin, every evil thought, every wrong passion, all of our brokenness, all of our screw-ups, born on the body of Jesus. We take the body and we take the life. And the blood which forms the covering, the blood that went on the doorposts, 
of the Passover lamb that the angel of death would pass by. The blood of Jesus shed for you for cleansing so that all that garbage, all that, any residue of guilt, <coughs> any residue of shame, the blood comes against that. It comes against the voice of the accuser that would say, how dare you? You didn't, you should have. Because there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We receive the blood of the new covenant. Phil, could you just gather those cups up there? Yeah? You good? Say Yahoo! Yahoo! <laughs> Begin with the end in mind, right? Wow. Okay. But there's more, right? Because it's not just Christmas Eve and Christ breaking in, the light breaking into the darkness, but it's also the start of Hanukkah, which is called the Festival of Lights. And the reason that we go there... John 10, then came the Feast of Dedication, Hanukkah, at Jerusalem. It was winter. Jesus was in the temple courts while in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were gathered around him saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Messiah, tell us plainly. So here's the biblical anchor. If you wanted to find the full story about Hanukkah, you have to go actually in between the Old and the New Testament. And to really find it in a Bible, do you know where you go to find it? In a Bible? Apart from there? Bible. Yeah, a Catholic Bible. It's one up there called Jerusalem Bible, and you can read all about it in there. We did not, uh, there's a whole other debate about why those weren't included in canon, but we think they're historically accurate. But let's just present again a quick, quick context of all this. But this one question is, why is this question now? Don't you find it interesting that God puts this question right now, if you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. It has to do with identity. We got to know who are you. Okay, and there's a reason for all of this because the pressure to conform to others is a huge part of what is celebrated in Hanukkah. The pressure, pressure coming. And so quickly, 2200 years ago, the government pressure was coming from without by Rome, various dictators, but there was cultural pressure within because as Rome was taking over, the Hellenists, which is kind of this Greek influence within the Hebraic culture, was getting more and more of a foothold. And so the faith was getting watered down and watered down. And there was a whole focus on a idolatry and there was a whole thing about external beauty rather than on the moral purity and truth that was represented through the faith. And so it reached an apex in about 174 BC. Antiochus, he was called Epiphanes, Epiphanes right? Or Ep 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 Epiphanes, <laughs> easy for you to say, right? But they gave him the nickname Epimanes, which means madman. That did not do them any favors. And so when the occasion came, the wrath fell on Jerusalem. And we won't go into all of it, but thousands upon thousands were killed. And there was this crash then to conform. Tell me if any of this is sounding sort of history repeating itself. Okay, you like this analogy here? I think this works pretty well. All these stones are individualized, but they're getting crushed down into just a smooth aggregate base. And so what happened? The worship was forbidden. The Torah was burned. You had Sabbath rest was outlawed. Circumcision was punishable by crucifixion. You circumcise your kid, they would crucify you as the mother and hang the baby around your neck. I mean, it was really nasty. And then the, the temple was taken over. It was desecrated. They, put it, they, they sacrificed a pig to an idol. And they made it a place of temple prostitution, right? And so that built up and built up and built up and built up and the pressure. But what's interesting is it got to a point where finally something had to give, right? And what's interesting is not dissimilar to Nazareth. It's like or Bethlehem, these little out of the way places, how God plants and starts something big. And he did the same too with a rebellion that would rise up. And it started out in a small village called Modin. And it started out with a, a little old priest and from there it grew and grew because this priest was being forced to go on an altar and sacrifice a pig and he refused. 
And so the soldier, the centurion, pointed to another guy, a Hellenist, who was going to do it. And the guy pulled out his sword and killed him. And an uprising came. Of course, you know most of the story. Judah Maccabees, a.k.a. the hammer, came down, right? And they came and overthrew. First it was a small rebellion. It grew and grew and grew. And eventually they took back Jerusalem. And when they did, they had to restore things. It was a cleanup time. It was a process time. The pressure to conform had been immense. They had pushed back. So the temple was restored. The idolatry was removed. They had to put a new altar because they couldn't use the old one. A new menorah had to be made, but they only had enough oil for one day because the oil was special. It had to be made under the seal of the high priest, and that was an eight-day process. So they used what they had, thinking, okay, well, we only got a day's worth, but that's better than nothing. But then it lasted for eight days. And Judah Maccabees said, let's declare a feast. So it's in that setting, right, in that time, in Solomon's colonnade, that the Jews are gathering around Jesus saying, if you're the anointed one, tell us, right? Why? Because they have an expectation of what this is going to look like political and military overthrow. And Jesus tries to explain to them it's not the way they think. There's a different path through. But it's critical in this time that we remember these things again because there's a question of identity that will come up in the midst of Hanukkah. This name, by the way, the celebration, the Feast of Dedication, it's also called the Feast of Lights because of the eight candles, and it's called Hanukkah. But here's what it reminds us about is the fact that there is a pressure to conform. Right? It's, it's, it's there. You can feel it. It's not that different. But we have to stay aligned in God's word. We stand, we fight, we go through into triumph. They were greatly outnumbered, but they stood their ground. We clean out our temples. Anything in your temple need to be cleaned out? Are you okay? Sacrificed any pigs on a false altar? Okay. And so you ignite the fire afresh, but you know oftentimes that you don't have enough, right? Who would have thought the little baby coming out in this backwoods stable would be enough, right? God loves to start small. But you've got to start with what you got. So you go on the road trip, right? You travel, what was it, 70, 90 miles? I'm trying to remember what we looked at again to get there. There's no room in the inn, okay? And you have your kid there in the stall with all the manure and everything else so it is but you start with what you've got and then you stay clear on your identity and right now this is kind of a lot of what goes and you know this verse right do not be conformed to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind okay the problem is a lot of us look like this we're doing it to ourselves okay so how many of you came in here totally chilled and relaxed today? How many of you were a little bit stressed out by the Christmas stuff? Okay. Now I had an office full of manure, so I, <laughs> I had an added thing. You know, poor Levi was running around. You know, see, this is the first time we've done a Christmas Eve, but there were two things that motivated it. One was the overlap with Hanukkah. We said, okay, there's a timing thing here. The other is we love to go somewhere for Christmas Eve and have a candlelight service. But we just haven't felt that there was a place that aligned right for what we wanted to do. So you know what? Stop complaining about it and just do it. If this place isn't suiting it for you, no worries. Let us support you to start something that does because there's likely to be dozens of people who need that. It's not too many. It's that there's not enough. And we have to be united by the things that unite us, which is the blood of the Lamb, the Word of God, the Holy Spirit. Right? Let's, okay, so to what are we submitting? Right? How are we submitting our thoughts? So everybody just, Lord, I repent of Christmas pressure. You got it? Yes. Okay. 
You know, we have gotten so far out of hand because there's a corruption factor that's happened both with Christmas and with Hanukkah. You know, you can go back even a couple hundred years, right? There was not all this craziness. Christmas was a quiet holiday. It was about giving and being with family. It wasn't about this plethora of stuff and cards and all the, oh my goodness, and are we going to meet the expectation of last day? Right? You know, and we keep, I mean, it just gets to be, on, on the day that's supposed to be the day of peace and joy, everybody's so exhausted they can hardly do it. Right? There's a commercial, I think it is from Mercedes, where the parents are waking the kids up. Come on, come on, come on, you gotta get up. Have you seen that, Ed? You know, yeah, and they go out because there's a Mercedes in the driveway. And the two kids are sitting there like drinking their coffee and going, oh, you know. But it's the look on their faces that makes it all worthwhile. It's just, it's just a flipped around. Hanukkah, the same thing has happened, right? There are a lot of rabbis who complain that Hanukkah has just become the Jewish Christmas. I mean, I knew that when I was in high school, I had, had Jewish friends, and I thought, well, that's amazing. They have eight days of presents. <laughs> what a ripoff, man. I gotta convert. But see, that didn't used to be the part there too, but culturally in the pressure of conformity, right? And when things move away from Christ to all of a focus upon giving or getting presents, get, 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 right? You just, you just feed that over time. So, keep going. So Jesus walking in the, in the Solomon's colonnade, that question about it is really a question about identity and it's about the pressure to conform. They wanted Jesus to conform to their image. Do you get it? Mm -hmm. yes. So as much as the Maccabeans overthrew through Judah Maccabee and the rest, the Romans and so forth, they want Jesus to do that, but Jesus is going, you're not gonna press me. That's that like culture from within that wants to get him to conform to a certain religious pattern. So, what we have before you here is some will call it a menorah. It's actually called a Hanukkiah. A menorah has how many lights? Seven. seven. A menorah has seven. That's the one in the temple. Okay, that representing the seven spirit, sevenfold spirit of God. A Hanukkiah has nine because it's one candle for each of the eight days. And I'll show you here in a second what we're going to do. We're going to light first. Actually, I'm going to wait because we're going to do the blessing here. We're going to light the servant candle. Shamash. Is that right? Say it. How do you say it? Uh, okay. The Shamash, otherwise known as the servant candle. That's the only candle you will light. And then that candle you serve, use to light each one. And so progressively, then the second night, you're going to put a second candle. For the first night, those just those two burn. You put another one in and you light them this way. And then the third night, another one, and there's a blessing you do. So what happens over time is you end up each night more and more light comes on. And we do this. And we pray, just a simple blessing, and then we just relax. We might watch some TV or do something, but it's just interesting because each night you get more and more and more light. It starts small. Each night it's the servant that's igniting all the other candles, and it grows brighter. So second night, third night, and down through the lane you go. So the servant candle always lights the other. It's progressively more light each night. It's like the event, it starts with one light, just like they had to start with just one day. And then it's like the incarnation, it starts small. Do you get the connects? And so when God aligns these two things, it's just like to me, it signals double blessing. Amen. You have for double blessing? Yes. I need a double blessing. You need double, double light breaking in? Okay, okay. The light shines in the darkness. The blessing said, Levi, can you want to, you up for doing this? Can you just say it out loud from there? Can we do it here? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Don't worry, I won't do the double steps. Yeah, yeah. Baruch Atar Nai Lachem, Melech Haolem, Asher Kisham Vitvotar, Vitvan Uichalik, Ner Shel Shabbat, Kodesh, Ner Shel Hanukkah, Kodesh. Blessed are you, Lord God. King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us to light the holy Hanukkah lights. Okay. So each night, you light the servant candle 
and then it goes and it will ignite the others. You, you, you're seeing a little bit of Jesus in this? Okay, we've done teaching before on, on Hanukkah, so it's kind of just a reminder of bringing it together. So the blessings, just as Levi said, blessed are you, Lord our God. Actually, let's say this together. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us to kindle the Hanukkah light. Okay? Sanctified means to set aside, right? To make holy. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who performed miracles for our fathers in those days at this time. You're remembering, right? There's a dreidel that people play the game, and there's four Hebraic figures there, and it means, for he did a mighty miracle there, or if you were in Jerusalem, here. And then this is said only on the first night of Hanukkah. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has granted us life, sustained us, and enabled us to reach this occasion. Amen? Amen. Okay. So, we're going to now connect the dots with a candlelight service. You have to understand that Hanukkah was in place, right, 150 years, 200 years before Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, oh. Jesus' birth didn't get celebrated until the you know, fourth century, right? The Romans kind of set it on a date, kind of try to redeem a date, December 25th, and do that. But you have to see the hand and the sort of the humor of God. And so... I love being able to go, right, and sing Silent Night at the end of a service. We're going to do that. And you're going to get your light, and it's going to source from the servant candle. Because there's one source of the light, right? But then it gets passed on. But before we do that, each has their own light. It's going to begin from a single and unifying source, and then it's going to multiply out as it's shared. Now. I have something that I thought about, I guess, last night. We always like to bless you guys in some way. This is going to be a little bit of an unusual blessing. Let me just take out one. You see what this is? Yeah, it, it's a $10 bill. So here is your challenge. There are little stickers on here. It says, Seed and Sow. And they're, they're like post-it notes, but we used a little bit of rubber cement so it wouldn't just fall off, okay? And there's one on the top here. Do you know why? Because if you're like me, you're going to put this in your wallet. And if you don't know that it's special, you're just going to, it's going to go out. Every one of these has been anointed with the king's oil. This is a special anointing oil that comes from Jerusalem. And it's been prayed over. And so we're going to sew into each of you $10. But here's how it works. It's a $10 challenge. It's a metaphor, it's a challenge, and it's an opportunity. You're going to be given a resource just as you've been given the light, right? You all took communion tonight, right? You've been given that resource. Now it's a question of how are you going to use it. Mm. This little light of mine, I'm going to light it. Okay. What are you going to put it under a bushel? No. no, I'm gonna. Okay, well now we're gonna, rubber meets the road. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to invest this somehow and transform it. That means someone that you don't know that well, or know but needs a lift. Preferably, probably not a family member, okay? Just telling you. But you know that person could really use a cup of coffee, but this is how it's gonna work. What I want you to do is just Get two bucks, two cups of Starbucks and have coffee with them sometime. Or go to McDonald's, you could almost get lunch for two, right, on this. Or you could go home and you could buy the stuff. So I want you, you can't just dump it in a pot. You buy a gift. Buy a book, buy some chocolate, whatever. But I, you need to think about it. I want you to think about it because this has been prayed and anointed and you are accountable before God for this $10. We are sowing it into you to multiply however you want. You could buy note cards and postage and start writing notes to people. Now please, let me encourage this. Don't be overly religious about this. Don't feel whoever you're taking out for coffee, you've got to share the four spiritual laws. I want you to just love on them. You don't have to go and buy a Christian book. 
somebody who needs encouragement, whose life is filled around cars, go and buy a couple of car trend magazines and say, you know what, I just felt in my heart I was supposed to do this for you. So I went out and bought them. Here you go. Bless you. Get the means to make cookies. Charlie, will you come up here, please? Now, I want you to very carefully, okay? So just one per person, okay? So I know your mom's out there, but she just gets one too. But Zadie, where's Zadie? Okay, well, Z Zadie gets one too. Well, actually, you can give it to, you can give it to her, your mom for now. She's back there crashed, that's okay. Okay, so go ahead, just one per person and then bring back the rest. <laughs> Questions about this, you get it? Now what I want is you, to, you put it in your wallet wherever it's, it's labeled so that hopefully you won't miss it. We are sowing into you to sow back in for kingdom. Now I wish this could be a hundred dollars or a thousand bucks. Okay, this is what, <laughs> that would be even more fun. Okay. But this is how it needs to be multiplied, because light multiplies out, right? The joy that started in the manger didn't stay there, right? It's away in a manger, but then up, if I be lifted up on the cross, I will draw all men unto myself, okay? Other questions? Here's what I want to ask of you. I want you to just drop me a note when you deploy it. Okay? I just want you to do that. So, you know what? You could go onto iTunes and buy, you know, music and send them via email to somebody. Just say, I was just thinking of you. I think you'll love this song. Here's, here's a free this. But you got I want you to, you, I want you to think about it. And if you can do it tangibly, if you can make something, buy something and hand it to somebody, then do that. And you don't have to explain it. You don't have to say why or where it came from. Thank you. You understand? Okay. Invest it so it multiplies. Okay. Helen? Actually, who can help out? Would you grab these and, and pass those out? The yep, yep. Let's grab a couple. Everybody put their money in your wallet. Phil, go ahead and turn that light out if you would. That no, that one, that one right there. The the no, the lamp. Is there a lamp light uh, underneath? Yeah, yeah. Joanne, over here. There's a foot switch. There's a sliding bar on it. Can you just move that? The Christmas tree will dim. Jim can or Laura, can you get that lamp there? Kim, that's okay. Kim, do you have the clicker for the? Just there we go. Well, I want to leave the fan on. And Joel, that night, that light in the back. Wow. And Helen, I want you, I want you to come up front. No, I, I want you, boy, I hope I can see this. No, no, no. Helen, Helen needs a candle. Hold on here. What? I have to see if I can see the music here. Okay, here we go. You guys good with this? Yes. So we're going to start to sing this. Helen. What we're going to do, Helen's going to come when we start to sing, and she's going to light her candle from the Shamash, and then she's going to go to the end, and she's going to light you up. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you're going to pass it down then, right? Now, you know the rule, right? You're supposed to hold, if you have the, your candle lit, you hold yours upright, and the person next to you puts theirs to it. If you try, if you have a candle lit, you do this, it's going to dump hot wax all over somebody, 
and if it's over the carpet, you know, we'll just bring you back with an iron tomorrow morning or something. So, okay. And uh, we're gonna we're gonna go that way. So Helen, you light the you light the ends, and then they will light each other. What? No, why don't you sit right now so you can. a little bit higher. beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the light shone in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Jesus, we celebrate you, the way you break in this year in a double blessing. The way you break in, connected to Hanukkah, because it was during that feast, and they tried to peg your identity like someone you weren't. And they didn't get it, but you were the Messiah. You said, the Father and I are one. Lord, we celebrate this double blessing in this year of sevens, of fulfillment, of covenant keeping, of summing forth. When the sword comes in and breaks open, breaks free, Lord, we celebrate all the goodness that is in Jesus. And Father, we acknowledge too that we have been given a light. You have sown into us with the question of what we will do with that light. Father, there is a world of darkness 
You don't ask us to go and light it all up. You just ask us to be present to all those we see. Lord, may each person here move with a keen awareness that for many people, they are the incarnate of Jesus in hands and feet and attention. Let us multiply this light. And Father, may we honor your birth and we, may we not of Jesus and not conform to the pressures, whether it's inside the church or out. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and give glory to your Father. Can we sing, can Gideon and I sing Silent Night in the one? Oh, please, please. Let me, um, let's see, can I hand this, Joel, can I hand this to you, please? So I, can I play? Is the key okay? Yeah. Oh, that would be neat. Want to, do you want to stand up here? you guys we celebrate the light and the life of Jesus that you carry and we honor the King thanks for being here love on each other be at peace Jim would you recite the ironic blessing over everyone here please the Lord God says to each and every one of you, that the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace, his light. In Yeshua's name, amen. Amen.